name is Brooke Sarson, and um, I'm here to talk about water harvesting, rainwater and gray water harvesting, um, and other cool stuff to do with water, and it's kind of timely after that nice big rain, or little rain, however you want to put it. Um, <laughs> just a little bit of background about me. Um, I do water harvesting here in San Diego. I've been doing it for the last two and a half years. Um, I started... You know, I just got really interested in water issues here in San Diego and wanted to do gray water and rainwater in my own space and looked around for somebody to get involved with to learn how to do that. And there was nobody here in San Diego doing it. So I went and I took a permaculture course in Arizona and learned more than just water and um, decided that, you know, San Diego had to have a resource and so I decided to be the resource and I converted my yard. I put in a 1,320 gallon rainwater tank and my laundry and bath gray water and opened my home to the public for regular open houses so people could actually um, feel like it was a more tangible thing um, because that's what I learned. I mean, I have experience going through Australia and Arizona where people are doing these things and it wasn't really scary to me but I realized a lot of people might be very intimidated by the idea of like a thousand gallon rainwater tank or ew, gray water, you know. So once you see it actually functioning in somebody's space, then you realize this isn't so bad, I could do this. And another important thing about what I wanted to do was, um, you know, I'm not a rich person. I just want to do the right thing. I don't want lead credits. I don't, you know, need to you know, I don't want to have to get permits and stuff. I just want to do the right thing, and I know there's a lot of people out there like me, and I want it to be a resource for them, so. Are you guys... Which one is this? This is water harvesting. The middle one is um, <coughs> is school, oh, school gardens, and the last one is time banking. Okay. Thank you. Uh-huh. The water one? Yes. Hey, Josh. Water. Mm -hmm. So we'll get started. Um, I think an important thing for all of us to understand before we try and address our water issues is where is our water coming from. And this is really important in San Diego when we realize only 20% of our water is coming from local sources. The rest of it is coming from hundreds of miles away. We've got the State Water Project, which takes water over 400 miles from Northern California. Um, and we have the Colorado River Aqueduct which takes another few hundred miles, you know, drains the Colorado River over into San Diego. And there's a lot of competition for these resources. And um, so we have to realize that it's not Sorry. water. For the time banking. Yes. Uh, yeah. It's all the way at the end. You can probably go. I think the gates are locked. No, there, okay. there should be a door before the end that okay. you could go in. Or it, you can go in the middle and then go th oh, around into the class. Um, so anyway, it's not, it's not very sustainable if we're drawing 80% of our water from, from far away. Um, and then there's this whole concept of water G, which we're starting to understand that, that uh, there, a lot of energy is involved in moving water and treating water and, and all of these things. And they're realizing 20% of California's electricity goes to managing water. 30% of the state's natural gas goes to managing water. So if we can reduce our water consumption, we also are reducing our energy consumption. Um, the State Water Project, which is bringing water from Northern California, even though we get more of our water from the Colorado River, we use more energy bringing the water from Northern California because we have to pipe it up over the mountains to get in, into Southern California. Um, the Metropolitan Water District, um, the d delivery of water to Southern California is one third of the total average household, you know, electric use. So that's that's pretty intense. Um, IPR is indirect potable resource, it's toilet to tap. It's one of the technologies that that San Diego is thinking about using. Um, it's pretty energy intensive compared to like, you know, catching rainwater off your roof and watering your plants with it. Um, desalination is far, far worse. So, I mean, desalination sounds like a, like, cool, yeah, there's tons of seawater, we should use that water, but it takes so much energy to do that. So let's think of something that doesn't take energy that we can, that we can all do. Like, desalination, I can't really 
it's not a tangible thing to me. It's not like I can get involved with that. Rainwater harvesting I can do in my own backyard. So we all can do something. Um, it's also important to see how we use water. This is water harvesting. Time banking's at the end, and the school gardens is in the middle. Uh huh. Um, so for San Diego County, um, when we realized that 55% of our water use is residential, that tells me that all of us as residents have like the biggest capability of, of you know, decreasing our water consumption or or creating a solution. Um, but if you further break that down and you realize that irrigation accounts for 60 to 75% of our, our residential water use, that tells me if I can just solve my, my irrigation in my yard, then I'm cutting into a big piece of that pie. If we could, say, reduce that chunk, you know, to like 20% or something, that's a lot of water that we don't have to bring in from you know, Northern California, the Colorado River to water our lawns, you know. So managing our yards is, is a good way to start. So creating a local water supply, how do we start? Some things that we're going to talk about, harvesting rainwater, recycling gray water, reducing your water use in your home. This is something that, that the water department actually has, you know, can tap into is like tell everybody fix your leaks, you know, replace your faucets with low fixture, with low flow fixtures and things like that. But we saw that irrigation is the biggest chunk of the pie, so that will help, but it's not going to solve the problem in the end. Um, and then as far as landscaping, I mean, these are things like you don't have to buy a fancy rainwater tank. You can you can get rid of your lawn, and we'll talk about that in a moment. You can pr plant drought tolerant plants though. You know, the Water Conservation Garden has like a list of the nifty 50. It's like 50 plants that are meant for like Mediterranean type climates from like Australia, the Mediterranean, California, the Southwest. Um, plant natives, they're most suitable for our soils and for our, our na na native water um, rainfall. Xeriscaping, create basins to hold the water and soak the water into the ground so it doesn't just, you know, flush out into the streets and out into the storm drains. Use mulch, it absorbs and it also prevents evaporation. Um, and redirecting storm runoff, runoff into your landscape instead of letting it again go into the storm drains. Cost effective strategy number one. So many people are like, okay, I want to store as, I can store like, you know, 8,000 gallons of rainwater. Like, you know, where do I put the tanks? How much is that going to cost? You know, all for the sake of, you know, maybe watering some their lawn or something like this. And I'm like, well, if you really want to save money, I mean, look at this. Lawns take 50 inches of water a year. So we get 10 here in San Diego. So that's another 40 inches of water you're putting onto your lawn that we're actually taking from Northern California or the Colorado River. A 500 square foot lawn needs 13,000 gallons of supplemental irrigation. So look at your water bill when you go home and see what does that look like on my water bill. Uh, uh, HCF is 100 cubic feet, which is 758 gallons, and that's how they, they do your water bill. So your water bill will show how many HCFs you use every month. And, and then if you cross a certain threshold, the cost for each HCF goes up. And then again, so there's like three tiers. Um, so... You know, just look at your water bill, see how many HCFs you use in an average month, and figure out how many months of, of irrigation you can account for by getting rid of your lawn. And that's cheap. I mean, sheet mulching or something like that is a really cost-effective way to get rid of a big water user. Whereas if you want 13,000 gallons of water storage to keep your, your lawn green all year, it's going to cost you more than $5,000. And that's on the low end. That's if you get, like... You have a big space for a big fat 10,000 gallon tank, and um, you know, if you want to do like underground water storage or something, that's like far more expensive. So, so this is just a good place to start. Why rainwater harvesting? It's a local water supply. Um, it reduces the need for pumping groundwater, which we don't do a lot of here, but there are places where where it's done. Um, it Provide, the water is, is superior to city water. It doesn't have chlorine in it. It doesn't have the salts in it. Um, 
the plants love it. Um, it it mitigates the salt buildup in the soil. Here in San Diego, we have the clay soil and the salt just kind of sits on the top. And a good flush of rainwater will push those salts down through the soil. And it's actually like a bioremediation, um, keeps the soil healthy. Um, in some places where the groundwater is brackish, um, the, if we divert the water into the soil, it'll um, dilute that brackish water underground. Um, reduces storm drain pollution if we keep the water on site and let the soil filter that water then it's not rushing down the street collecting pollutants and then going directly out to the waterways um, mitigating urban flooding and erosion um, if we, again if we keep the water on site or you know put it into tanks somehow keep it from just rushing and, and flowing in, in heavy torrents then we're not going to have issues with flooding um, it's a lot less expensive than desal and, and the toilet to tap that we discussed. And there are really simple low cost solutions like getting rid of your lawn, you know, growing things that are that keep the soil healthy, and um, earthworks, which we'll, we can talk about. Um, so the simplest way is just to redirect your storm runoff. Disconnect your downspout from you know, wherever it's flowing, like down the driveway or out into the storm drains, and keep it on your property. Obviously, you don't want to put it like right next to your foundation, but if you can find a way to direct it into your landscape, that would be great. These pictures are kind of hard to see, and that's unfortunate, but um, I won't worry about this one. But here, this is like a garage, and somebody had taken the downspout and routed it like all the way down into the front yard, where it basically just went out into the street. And so we disconnected that and we just have a, like, you can't see, but there's like a little 55 gallon drum. Um, so we directed it into the 55 gallon drum, which then overflowed into basins in her yard. So all of those, you know, those thousands of gallons a year, which you might not believe that that's possible, but we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, instead of just going straight out to the street now, it's all going into her yard. Um. And an interesting thing is um, you, you using compost to improve your soil absorption. absorption. Um, you know, sand is really porous. The water just goes right through it. Um, it doesn't really hold water. Um, clay seems like it just holds water forever. Like our clay soil here in San Diego, it's just like a bowl. It just The water sits there forever. And so you think, oh, that's great. You know, it's a good way to hold water. That's only 20%... Um, Absorption, whereas if you put compost in your soil, it holds 900%. It has 900% absorption. It's like a giant sponge. So if you can you know, get your soil really healthy and put the compost in and then put the mulch over it to hold the water in and prevent it from evaporating, you're going to get a lot of moisture in your, in your soil for a long period of time. Um, another way um, to, do, to harvest rainwater um, and protect our environment is to decrease your impervious surfaces. So um, a lot of us, we have like, there's like concrete everywhere, paving everywhere. If you can find ways to get rid of some of that and put something more porous in, like even bricks or, or something that will allow the water to at least saturate into the soil a little bit more, that's a good way for us to keep the rain from just, you know, flowing out. Um, so there's some earthworks that you can do to help keep the water in the soil and in your space. Um, you know, terraces, we think of terraces as these like kind of flat steps. Um, but even then, like if they're compact flat steps, the water's just going to flow off. If you can rethink it a little bit and kind of curve the steps backwards a little bit, it'll hold the water in long enough for it to soak into the ground. And I'm talking about this because because, like, if you just look at your lawn and it's, like, compact, you know, and, and the soil's not that great, and when the rain falls, it, it, it only soaks in, like, so much. But if you have something more like a basin, you know, some, some kind of indentation where the water can actually um, hold, get, um, be held for a little while while it's raining, then that water is going to soak in and more is going to come and it's going to soak in and it's going to soak in really deep. Like you're going to get one, two, three feet of, of saturation underground and tree roots and shrub roots from all around are going to be drinking that water long after it stops raining. 
Whereas that little bit of lawn where it's like all compact and flat and probably graded so that it's the water's flowing off, that um, that's only going to get like a couple inches maybe max of saturation and pretty soon you're going to have to water right again. So it's important to keep your soil healthy and keep the water in your soil. Um, so these are some, some examples of how we can rethink how we're doing things. Right now we have these homes and these landscapes where we want the water to get out as fast as possible away from our houses and out onto the street. We don't, we don't want water sitting anywhere, you know, and so we make sure that the water flows off the roof and like onto the driveway and out to the street and like all of our land is like hard packed and like, you know, slanted out to the street. So the water just flows, flows, flows. It's not healthy, though the plants can't, you know, get a lot of water. And then, you know, all of the, um, you know, say you have fertilizer on your lawn or, you know, there's soil here or whatever, it's all getting washed off onto the sidewalks and out into the storm drains. And so you can't really grow much here. Whereas if you rethink it a little bit and you plan for the water to first go from the roof maybe into a rainwater tank and from there to overflow into a basin around the tree where it can get caught and hold and soak in, and you see the flow of water here is going like this, so you put a little basin there, you know, and then you can grow something there, and then from there it overflows. And along the way it's caught and held, and so when by the time it reaches the street, it's a far less amount of water going down the, the street. And, and you're using that water to grow things. Um, and a lot of times we see these these berms around trees and we think well when, when I water when I water I don't want the water to go away so I'm going to put these berms around the trees to keep the water in but what happens when it's raining and all this free water is trying to get in and it can't you know it's diverted around so if you rethink it and you put it, um, the, the plants and the trees into basins just like indentations in the ground now the, all the free water can get in too but when you water it can't get out also. So, you know, and some trees, they don't like their crowns to be sitting in the water or something, so you can put those up on a little pedestal and put the basin around where the, the drip line of the tree is, because that's where the roots extend to. Um, a swale, this is another kind of earthwork. Um, it, it's actually kind of convenient for some of our yards where we have like just gently sloping um, like lawns going to the pavement. If you rethink that and have it gently sloping, but at the end you have this little hump, which is the swale, then when the water flows, it gets caught behind the hump and it has to soak in before it you know, can get out. And so then you have what they call is a, a bioswale. And then you can plant things that are more drought tolerant on top of the swale and things that like more water on the inside of the swale. And you can maybe even plant things that like that seasonal water so that you don't have to water. It's like they get just enough water when it rains, you know, to, to survive. So this is where it gets kind of juicy when we realize how much water we really have access to in San Diego. A lot of people think, well, it's not worth catching rain because it doesn't rain very much here. It rains about 10 inches a year, which isn't very much. But the rule of thumb is off a thousand square foot roof, you can get 600 gallons of water from only one inch of rain. So multiply that times 10. Now the problem is where on earth do you put a holding tank that big? <laughs> so it's, it's about managing your resources. But if you can apply that rule of thumb to your own space, you can see you can actually have a, a pretty big potential. This is water harvesting. And if you guys want, the community gardens is in the middle and time baking's at the end. Um, so that's a good place to start to see how much your, your capability is. And then at that point you have to figure out, well, what do I need to water? If you have like one little veggie patch, you probably don't need to store 9,000 gallons of water or whatever, you know? So, or maybe you just don't have the space, you know, maybe you have the space for like a thousand gallons. And, and you'll all be surprised at where you can fit this in. You know, a 55 gallon drum isn't gonna, um, isn't gonna get you very far, but it's a start. 
but you can definitely, if you if you think a little bit more about your space, you can put tanks in like far-reaching places. It doesn't have to be right next to your house, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, you can hide them. You can create use them as a feature. There's a lot of different ways to integrate them into your space, um, and then you have this really high quality water. Um, I, I think I have to go through this pretty quick. So um, basically, the, the important thing to understand is that you need to filter the water before it gets into the tank. And the reason for this is because when you have like this big behemoth of a tank, you don't want to have to clean it out all the time. So it's really simple filtration. There's a, a leaf eater, which is a slanted screen. I didn't bring one, but if you, and that's not, it's hard to see that picture, but if you look in here, you can see them. But it's just it's just a slanted screen that that um, you know keeps all the leaves and and big debris out of your tank. And then there's a smaller screen that keeps like some of the asphalt from your asphalt shingles out. And then there's a first flush first flush diversion. And what happens is like ap after it hasn't rained for a long period of time, like all this dust and stuff, um, pollen, like. Um, air pollution, bird poop, all of that settles on your roof and when the first rain comes it all gets washed off. Now you don't want that stuff getting in your tank. So what you do is you have a way for it to be diverted and we have like a, a stand pipe and that fills up with the first amount of water and there's like a little <laughs> ball in there and then that flows up to the top and blocks off a T-junction and then all the other water then goes into the tank pretty clean. And so the water in the tank is really clean. I mean, if you have a 55-gallon drum, it's, you know, it's probably going to be a little bit dirty. But if you have a 1,000-gallon reservoir of water, that water is going to stay very clean, like probably for years. You're not going to have a problem. Um, and it's super high-quality water because um, it doesn't have the salts and the chlorine that's in city water. Um, so what kinds of considerations you have to have? Um, Above ground systems are, are by far the least expensive. Um, underground systems tend to cost a lot because of the cost of excavation and pumping and special materials. Um, you're looking at probably four to seven dollars a gallon, whereas for a simple above ground um, system, you can you know get them for as low as fifty cents a gallon. The the cheapest kinds of things are round plastic tanks. Um, and here, this one is like a 500 gallon tank, so you can see it's not humongous or overwhelming. It's got about a four foot diameter, and it's like, I don't know, five and a half feet high or something like that. Um, but you have to think, can I get this in my yard? Sometimes I get so excited, and I'm like, yeah, you can store thousands of gallons back here, and we'll get this big old tank. And I forget, oh shoot, how are we going to get it in the, back, in the backyard? <laughs> so um, that's something to consider where you have the space, you know, whether you have something with a, that can take a four foot diameter, a six foot diameter, something a little bigger, whether you want it not to go so high so it, you know, your neighbors could see it or, you know, just things like that. So there's lots of considerations, there's lots of different things on the market. Um, and the delivery cost, there's a guy out um, in Alpine, San Diego Tank, and he's like the biggest supplier of tanks for probably Southern California that I know of. And he, his delivery costs are pretty cheap. They're like $75 for a tank or something, which is good. Um, the cost of the tank, like I said, there's these simple round plastic tanks, about 50 cents a gallon. You can get like a thousand gallon tank for like, yeah, 500 bucks, 600 bucks. Um, you look at this company called Bushman and they have a little bit fancier tanks. They're all set for rainwater. All their inlets and outlets are mosquito proofed and they're more like a dollar a gallon, but they're nice tanks. Um, and then there's like slimline tanks. Actually, I'll, I'll show you all those pictures in a minute. And those are more expensive because, um, you know, they're more foo-foo. It takes more materials to make them structural, have structural integrity. Um, so there's, you know, a dry system, which is basically, you know, you have the tank up against your house, the water comes right from the gutter and through the filters and right into the tank. There's no water sitting in the pipes along the way. Um, in a wet system, what you can do is put your tank like in a far corner of your yard and underground the pipes that go over to the tank and then bring them up. And as long as the inlet to the tank is lower than the, um, like your 
gutter or where the water is coming from, the water will siphon through. Um, the problem with this setup is A, you know, if it freezes, your pipes might break, but we don't have that problem here in San Diego much. And B, um, if you don't screen the, the inlet and outlet of the pipes, then mosquitoes could get in and breed under there, mm. so that's something that's important. Um, you could have like a flush out or something like that along the way. But this is a great way to incorporate your tanks into your landscape, you know, somewhere somewhere else than right next to your house, which most people don't necessarily want to do. Um, it's important to think of how much water weighs. It's over 8 pounds a gallon, so even a 55-gallon drum, when it's full, is going to be about 450 pounds. So make sure you have it where you want it before you get it full. Um, and water pressure, so obviously we need to think of how are we going to use this water. A lot of people want to hook it up to their irrigation systems, and you can do that. It's a little bit, it's a, well, a lot more expensive. Um, you have to put, have a pump and tie it into your irrigation system and be able to switch back and forth between the city water and the, the rainwater. And um, it that's, could be about a thousand gallons more. And when you think of water, um, it's only like five thousandths of a cent a gallon, you know, like to buy water from the city. You know, by the time you pay for a water tank and then you pay to get it integrated into your irrigation system, that's really expensive and the payback period is, is really long. So, you know, sometimes this makes sense for people with like a lot of space and they're all like hands off of their, their irrigation and um, they just want it all turnkey. They want to store lots of water and then just have it all work pretty smoothly. But, you know, some of us are actually out in our gardens. We like to, you know, water and like pick a weed or two while we're doing it. So if you can just use simple gravity-fed irrigation, that is, or a simple gravity from your tank, that's like the most cost-effective way to utilize these systems. So if you can get your tank in a high spot in the yard, then the gravity will just, you know, push it out of like a hose or a spigot. You could use a watering can. Um, it's more labor intensive, but if you're going to do that anyway, then it then it works. Um, but you can always calculate the water pressure that you could get out of your system, you know, by calculating how tall the tank is when it's, you know, and then so when the water is, when it's full, like how high the water is from the place where you're putting the water, and then you can figure out how many PSI you're getting. And just know that most drip irrigation requires at least 15 PSI to function function efficiently. <clears throat> so here's simple rainwater catchment, 55 gallon drums. You can get these from a woman in town. They're recycled. They held olives, pickles, fruit juice concentrates. Um, and you can chain them together. You can, you know, use them in a lot of different ways, but 55 gallon drum, uh, drums will fill up like at the drop of a hat. I mean, you can basically stick one of these under a place in your roof with no gutter and it'll fill up, you know, just from the drips off the roof. So, um, but it's a good start. Um, here's some larger systems. Um, you know, these are, this is like a typical round plastic tank. Sorry for the quality of the, the picture. Here's some slimline tanks. This is the one from Bushman. It's a 620 gallon tank. It's like $1,300. This is my tank. It's a 1,320 gallon tank. It's like $1,300. So you can see you're getting twice the amount of storage for the same amount of money. Um, but some people really want something slim because they ha don't have a lot of space. And you can use these for other purposes, like you know, you can build a fence with you know just stacking them in line or whatever, and it's a water wall. Um, so there's lots of different ways you can store water. Um, so now we can get into gray water. And we're doing good. Um, so gray water, as defined by the state of California, is wa household water except for toilet water, kitchen sink water, dishwasher washer water, and photo processing sinks, because I know you all have those. Um, but the kitchen sinks and the dishwashers are higher in um, particulate matter, and so it could cause more of a bacterial con um, contamination problem. So that's why California is worried about it. Um, and there's, I think there's ways to do it safely, but, but I'm not supposed to tell you about those. Um, I'm sorry about the pictures. I wish I could show you what's going on. But um, So are you guys interested in water or community gardens or food, time banking? Community gardens is in the middle. You can go through the door. 
So again, why, why should we use gray water? Well, again, we want to reduce our, our um, reliance on municipal water sources because we know that only 20% of our water is local. Um, le so if, if we have less water that we're putting in through the sewer systems, that's less water that has to be processed in the sewage plant. So that's less energy that's being used. So now you're reducing energy in two ways. You're not only reducing your demand for water, you're also reducing the amount of energy that is used to process the water at the other end. So gray water is double cool. Um, and actually, treat, you know, we think about this water as being dirty, like your laundry water or your bath water, we think about it being dirty. Um, but what's happening is it's going to the sewage plant, they take out solids, and they basically just shoot it out into the ocean. So there's no, there, it's not like really being treated before it's like touching wildlife. Whereas if you're releasing it into the soil in your yard, the soil is actually filtering that water. And not only that, but if you're keeping your soil healthy, there's lots of biological activity in there. There's worms and microorganisms and there's stuff growing in there and sucking up the nutrients. And now that water that's filtering through the soil and, and probably still getting into the water table and working its way out into the waterways is clean. So, so that's good. Um, um, and it's great for plant growth. I know we think of soaps as, oh no, that soap is going to kill my plant. But if you use the right soaps, soaps have um, nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus in them. Those are the three fertilizing agents that you pay lots of money from the store to buy. So you're actually, you get really good plant growth a lot of times from gray water. Um, and the nutrients, you know, the nutrients we wash off our bodies and, um, you know, wash out of our clothes. You know, those are actually going into the ground to, you know, replace the nutrients that we take out of the environment and the atmosphere and, and stuff. Um, also, increasing your awareness and sensitivity to natural cycles. You know, when you use gray water and you see how your yard, like, relies on this water source now, it's like you have to take, you know, your yard relies on you taking two showers a day. You know, you have two people in your house, you take two showers a day, and your, and your yard relies on that. Now all of a sudden if you have visitors from out of town and you like are taking four showers a day and you see how your plants react or you go away for a week and nobody's taking showers and you see how your plants react or you put something really crappy down the drain and you see how your plants react, it's in your face. It's not something that's somebody else's problem way down the line. It's something that you're confronted with and then you start to understand like how integrated it all is, you know, and it starts with us. So that's kind of a cool thing about gray water that I didn't really understand until I lived it. Um, as far as San Diego is concerned, we're following the California Plumbing Code, which last August um, formally accepted gray water um, use. And San Diego is still trying to figure out exactly how that looks for San Diego. But they have this information bulletin 208, which I have up here if you guys want to look at it and it outlines like the requirements basically if you use a simple laundry to landscape system then um, you don't need a permit if you use any kind of gravity fed system from um, like from your bathtub or something then you do need to get a permit at least I'm supposed to tell you that but <laughs> um, nobody's really policing that too much um, and, you know, when the permit costs $550, and that's basically what it would cost for me to put in a system, then it's kind of hard to justify doubling that cost, especially for people like me who just want it simple and effective. So, um, so there's just information. Um, if, if you want to really understand how to do gray water safely and effectively, um, there's the Arizona Gray Water Guidelines. And they've been doing, they've had this in place for years now where they say you don't need a permit as long as you follow these simple guidelines. And they're really easy under, to understand. It's like um, any gray water storage tank is covered to restrict access and to eliminate habitat for mosquitoes. I mean, that's easy to understand, you know. Um, so that's a good, a good resource. And I picked one that was kind of funny, but you're not supposed to store gray water. Um, for more than 24 hours. So we'll talk a little bit about when a surge tank is involved, but you don't typically store gray water.
Um, so the elements are of a gray water system. You start by using as, as little water as possible. So you have high efficiency clothes washer, you know, low flow fixtures on your faucets, um, no leaks. You know, you start by reducing your water consumption in the home. Now you know how much water you have to work with. Then you use these, um, you need to put in diverter valves. And these, what these do is, um, even though you have your gray water going out to your yard, you still want to be able to put it back into the city water for whatever reason. Like it's been raining for two weeks and everything's flooded and you don't want your gray water going out there and flooding and overflowing and maybe getting out into the storm drains. So you just flip it back. You know, maybe you're washing a load of diapers. You all look like you're washing loads of diapers. Um, you know, you flip it back or a load of bleach or something. Um, this would be like a typical laundry water valve and then this would be a typical, you know, bath or shower valve. Um, it's a Jandy Neverlube, get at any pool supply store. Um, but these are, uh, even in the, the bulletins, it's, you know, outlined as part of what you need to do to put in a gray water system. You have to have a way to divert it back to the city. Um, and when the water finally gets out, you put it into mulch basins. You don't like apply it to a lawn or um, you don't like have it spreading over a large area. You want to keep it in isolated areas that are not really places where people or animals are going to come into contact with it. Plus you want the water to soak in. You know, you don't want it to just run off. You want it to soak in. Um, and you then you use trees or plants that are okay with gray water. Um, th some things like California natives are really sensitive to higher salt content in the soil, which gray water has higher salt content. So you, you might want to stay away from some of that. Um, also things like blueberries, they like acetic soils, whereas the salty soils tend to be more alkaline, so you won't be able to grow blueberries very well. Um, and finally, gray water, gray water friendly soaps like Oasis, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, complications, reasons why you might not be able to use gray water or things you might want to think about when you're implementing a gray water system. Um, if you're too close to your neighbors or the street and the water might, you know, spill over, it, it's okay for you to use your gray water, but your neighbor didn't really consent to use your gray water, so keep it in your own space. Um, also, if you're on a slab, that's kind of tough. I mean, usually you can still get to your laundry system. If it's on an outside wall, it's pretty easy, but um, it's hard for the the, um, the showers and the baths because you actually have to get in under the drain and that's in the slab. So some people get really crazy and get these like pumps that they pump out the water from the bathtub after they've taken a shower or something and have it hose going out their window, but it gets a little bit excessive. Um, even better would be to have it implemented as part of our regular building codes, have gray water stub out, so we're working on that now too. Um, you know, if your soil is either too permeable, so say you're like right on a cliff by the ocean and you have like super sandy soil and you're releasing your gray water into the soil, it's not going to get much filtering before it like goes out into the ocean. So that's, I mean, that's extreme, but it's something to think about. And also like here in San Diego, we have these really clayey soils and they just hold water. So you really have to make sure that you size your basins appropriately to hold the amount of water that you're going to be releasing. Otherwise, it's just going to sit there and then it's going to breed mosquitoes and it's go, going to go anaerobic and get stinky and then your neighbors are going to have a problem with it and they're going to tell on you and then it's going to be a problem for everybody. Um, so, you know, you make sure that, that your water, can, that your soil and, and your space can handle the amount of water you're sending out. Um, you don't want any human contact to occur. So you're not, like I said, you don't want to water lawns with it because lawns are typically places for people and animals to recreate on. So there is a potential for bacteria to be carried through the, the water and then, you know, you lay on it, you touch it with your hands, you put your hands in your mouth and, you know, people get sick. And, and there's no historic record of people getting sick from using gray water at this point, but we don't want to make that the case because that's why California has such strict regulations in the first place. They're afraid of like everybody getting sick. And so if we just do it right in the first place, then we won't have that problem. Um, so again, if you're sick or you are washing diapers or whatever, turn it back to the city. Um, you can use it for like trees, fruit trees. You can use it for 
ornamental trees and shrubs, even vines like berry vines and tomato vines where the fruit is growing up and out and it's not actually coming into contact with the gray water. But you don't want to water things like root vegetables or um, leafy green vegetables. You know, anything where the food that you put in your mouth might actually come into contact with the gray water. You know, if you can put the gray water underground, that's better, like even under the mulch. Um, but like if you're going to grow your squash or something, like right in the basin, that might be a problem. You know, just keep your food out of the gray water. Um, and I think that the, the information bulletin says you're not supposed to water any food producing things with gray water. But that's really extreme, and, and most people water like their fruit trees and stuff with it, and you know berry vines, and, and it's not a problem at all. Um, the problem wouldn't be that the bacteria travels up through the roots and into the food. The, bac the problem is the bacteria would touch the part of the plant that you're going to put in your mouth. Um, and you don't want to spray the gray water because then the bacteria can become you know air airborne. Um, so using a surge tank, this is one thing that I think people associate gray water with. Um, I'm just going to go here. Um, so you have your laundry water hose just directed into this 55 gallon drum, you know, and then watering things. But this is not a storage tank. What this is, is it's like you have this one little place in your yard where you're putting your gray water and it's, um, you know, it's like one tree basin and you have this 55, 50 gallon surge coming out of your laundry machine. And if it goes into that little basin, it's going to flood everywhere. So what happens is it goes into this 55-gallon drum first, and then it slowly leaks out through, through this, like, smaller hose in the bottom, you know, and it slowly leaks out so that it can soak into the ground better. Um, so that's what the surge tank is for. It's like if you don't want to hard pipe your system. Um, and it can still be effective, and it still has its purposes. But the important thing is you don't, you just want to be careful when you do this. It's it's pretty cost effective, but you don't want that water to stay in there for more than 24 hours. When you do these system, it requires more maintenance. Like you have to clean out this 55 gallon drum because it's going to get pretty nasty. Things can clog along the way and get backed up. So you still want to be able to have it so that if it overflows, it goes back into the, you know, into the city water. Um, you need to keep mosquitoes out. Um, so. That's just like the simplest system, but it requires a little bit more maintenance. Um, this, this is like a really simple system. It's a little bit more energy intensive to put in, but then it's pretty much hands off. And this is, this is the system that I like to put in, and this is the system you don't need to permit. Um, and this is why, even if you're on a slab, a lot of times you can use your laundry water. Um, because if it's on an outside wall, all you have to do is make sure you put the valve in, put the one side going back into um, the wall or wherever the, the sewer is. And the, on the other side, you can just pop out, like it's a one inch pipe, pop a hole out of your wall and direct this pipe to the different places that you want it to go. So you, like here you see there's you know a few different places where it's going and the, pre the washing machine has a pump on it. So it can push that water out you know, further a little bit higher, you don't have to rely on gravity to get that water where you need it. So then you can do your calculations. I mean, some of us have really, like if you have an old machine, it's 50 gallons, you know, a load. So that's one fruit tree a week, you know, um, if you only do one load. If you do two loads, that's like two to three fruit trees a week. So you can then just shoot it out to the places where you want it and you get free watering. You know, and then maybe you just make sure that you don't have that on the same sprinkler system as the rest of the yard. Um, even if you have a super high efficiency washer, 10 gallons a load, you know, say you do two loads a week, that's 20 gallons, 352 um, weeks, um, 52 weeks in the year. So that's a thousand gallons of water, right? Um, and you can put a system like this in. For, I mean, if you did it yourself, like the materials for this might cost you $150. If you, um, you know, had somebody like me do it, maybe $450, $500. If you were to buy a thousand gallon rainwater tank, that alone would cost you $500. And then to install it and with all the extra parts might cost you up to a thousand. So even a 10 gallon a load 
washing machine is worth putting in a gray water system rather than, you know, going and buying a rainwater tank. You know, it just depends because this gray water you obviously can't apply to your leafy green veggies. So, you know, it's good to have a balance of resources, but if people are looking for like simple low cost ways to, you know, save money or conserve water, after getting rid of your lawn, this is like what I tell people to do. So, um, this is this is the one in my yard where you can see like the pipe. Um, the garage is kind of over here, and the pipe comes out and goes along this basin, and it has several outlets along the basin. And um, so every time I do a load of washing, my banana trees get fed water. So I never water my banana trees, and I get tons of bunches off of them. Um, and then you cover all that up and you don't even know it's there. Um, the basic elements, the diverter valve, you know, um, on these systems we put like a half inch ball valve at, you know, five or six different places along the line because then you can control the pressure at each place. Like maybe the water will come out strongest at the first place in the line. So now you can turn it down a little bit and push the water further down the line with these ball valves. Um, this is a check valve, and it makes it so that when the, the water doesn't get sucked back into the laundry machine, it like has an air release there. Um, this is just gravity-fed shower plumbing. So here's like the shower drain, and you know you don't want to have these diverter valves like somewhere far under your house where you have to like do an army crawl like at eight o'clock at night and you're toweled to like you know, flip the valve if you're going to take like an Epsom salt bath or something. Um, you want it accessible and it's not always that easy to make it accessible inside the bathroom. So at least you can take the plumbing to an outside wall where you put the diverter valve and then bring the plumbing back into the main sewer line and then the other side of the diverter valve will go out into your garden. And when you're using a gravity flow system like this, you need to make sure you have about a quarter inch linear foot of fall so that the water continues to flow and doesn't pool in the pipe along the way. So you have to consider that because that might mean that you have to trench, you know, pretty far down by the time you get to the end of it. Um, so here's the simple gravity fed system, the diverter valve, um, and this is a, you use like a, you can use a branch drain system. So these, these systems aren't under pressure. The gravity is just, you know, pushing the water along. So what we put in is these um, double L plumbing fittings. And if you install this perfectly level, it'll split the water in half. And so then, you know, you can have like one basin over here, one basin over here, and the water, you'll get, you know, 50% of your water here, 50% of your water there. So it's just a kind of a low-cost, efficient way to, you know, create a gravity-fed gray water system with your shower drain. Um, this is just some other cool ways to, um, you know, have your water spreading out. Um, if you don't want to have like basins everywhere and like these open areas where the water goes into, you can put it underground into like these infiltration chambers or. I mean, people come up with all kinds of cool ways where you basically disperse the water into a centralized area and then from there it kind of extends out. And what these things do is it's like, like kind of like what they use in septic systems, like for, as a leach field, like the, there's all holes and stuff on the sides. And um, this is like a make-it-yourself one that, that we did. Um, and so the water goes into this big open air tunnel, so that area is not going to get all plugged up with roots and stuff. So the system won't get plugged up. And then the water soaks out on the sides into the areas around here, and then you plant all of that up. And you don't even know that the gray water is there, and I'll show you. So this is like the system at my house where it's like the water basically goes into this underground infiltration chamber, and it goes over into this open basin. And you cover all of that up, and you can't really see, but you know, a couple years later it's like, that water that's sitting underground is feeding like five fruit trees and you know tons of other stuff and you don't even know it's there. So, um, so just with the detergents, that Oasis is like the best one on the market for the laundry. There's another one called Ecos you could use. You want to avoid salts, um, anything like sodium lauryl sulfate. 
There's a lot of good products out there um, that have salt in it because salt is a natural product. It's not bad. It's just that they didn't intend for you to put that product onto your, onto your soil. So you just have to be careful and really look around. Um, avoid sodium, borax, and bleach. The whole thing with phosphates is just that when you take a shower with something with phosphates and it's going right out into the ocean, that buildup of phosphates is harmful to the fish. But if you're releasing those phosphates into your soil, your plants are like, yay, I got phosphates, and it's good. So, um, so don't worry so much about the phosphates. And I, I did blog on it, and you can find some other products there. Um, we talked about where to use gray water. There are some natives. They've done some um, research because they water the sides of the freeways with the purple pipes, which is like the recycled water. But it's really high in salts um, because they don't worry about getting the salts off. They just make sure that it's not contaminated with pathogens. <laughs> um, and so what happened is they were planting all these drought-tolerant things on the sides of the freeways that were dying. And so they realized it's because they don't have high salt tolerance. And so then they did some studies to find some natives that do have good salt tolerance. So that's just there if anybody's interested. And there's a list of resources. And does anybody have any questions? Yes? I, uh, we just put in rain barrels from our gutter system a couple, maybe a month ago. Mm -hmm. So we get 60 gallons of water. You know, just after a little, you know, this morning. What do you use all that water for? Like, we're still just kind of, you know, getting plants and things like that, but are there other things that you use with all your water? Um, I mean, that water goes to my pets as well. Um, I don't know about a 55 gallon, those 50, 60 gallon drums, because they tend to be a little bit dirtier, especially if you're not pre-filtering. Um, I mean, I drink my water. And I don't recommend that because without post-filtering, you should probably test your water. And then there's probably some simple like charcoal filter like a Brita that works or it just depends. Um, but yeah, just watering the plants, I guess. Um, I mean, that's, I guess the thing is, it's like if you have your food plants, that is a great way to use the water. Um, secondary would be like ornamental plants or things like that. But 60 gallons, I mean, that's a couple fruit trees in a week, and then it's gone. Um, we had a bunch of mold, uh, mulch in our place, and it got moldy. Do you have any tips for just making sure that it doesn't happen? Moldy? Are you sure it was moldy and it wasn't like uh, like mycelium and, and funguses? It might have been. It was white. Yeah, I think because what happens is um, like the mycelium, um, it loves um, decaying wood and it's actually like a great decomposer of decaying wood and so it's probably beneficial rather than gross. Mm -hmm. I saw something on the internet. In Europe they bury wood because it absorbs the wood and holds it for a long time. Is that something that you've worked with? Um, so you could bury, let's say if you were putting it like your mulch area, if you put wood there, I mean the mulch is kind of the same thing but they actually bury logs and then that holds the water for a long time and it slowly releases it yeah, yeah, I mean, we have the same situation with our clay soil. Basically, the clay soil just holds the water so intensely um, that after a while, the water doesn't percolate vertically anymore. It just percolates laterally. And so... We don't really need it here. Though. Yeah, yeah. It might be good for places where it's like a more porous soil or something. Mm -hmm. I'm just surprised that the bacteria coming off of washing the water would be such a concern that you can It's California. Is it more regulatory concern? It is. You know, there's the problem that I've come across here in San Diego is nobody wants to deal with this. They're like, it's your problem. No, it's your problem. And so it's like, if nobody's willing to even like say, I'll handle it, you know, that's because everybody's scared because nobody really knows what it's like. So that's why it's a problem for us, you know, but I mean, you know, unless you're sick or there's, yeah, like, you know, feces or something, I, there's not really a, a problem. But, but again, I mean, just to be safe, I wouldn't put it directly onto, like, leafy green vegetables, you know. It would definitely be more of an issue with, like, your kitchen sink water where you're, like, rinsing down things with, like, animal proteins, product, yeah. pro proteins in it and stuff like that. Um, but, yeah. yeah. I mean, I can't expect you to answer. We have an advocate for it. I just was wondering. It's more of a regulatory issue. 
it is. You know, and I think that if, I mean, there are a lot of people right now who are basically releasing their laundry water onto their lawn because they don't know the rules, like they just think it's a cool idea. Um, you know, they don't understand that there might be some health and safety issues. And, and then they might just as soon, you know, not have a way to turn it back to the city. So then they'll wash their diapers and that'll go to their lawn too. So they have to have a way to cover their backs, you know. And this is a way where we're saying, like, in general, don't do it that, that way, you know. Yep. Are, is there any um, move to uh, improve, like, catchment off of commercial buildings, like the downtown area? Or? You know, there. Um, I do have a woman that I, I work closely with, and she works on bigger projects, and they're working on cool stuff like putting a gray water into flushing toilets, like cleaning it up and flushing toilets with it. Um, Right now, there's not a big commercial move. Um, they're more like uh, apartment complexes and things like that are more interested in these technologies. But in general, corporations and 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 the city is not really working towards like requiring or making people interested in it. I mean, when a city is ready to do that, they'll do things like put rebates in place, you know, and you know, advertise more, like create programs, but we're not there yet, so it's, it's not up at that scale, unfortunately. 